something that we can't hear. That's cute. So the definition of ultrasound is, any takers? Uh, frequency that's higher than the audible sound for humans. It's okay. Like 20 like megahertz. Uh, 20 kilohertz. Yeah. So, yeah. It's, uh, it's sound reflection from tissue interfaces. Okay. So the these are method uh, uses frequency waves to produce images. Okay. How about generation of sound by electrical impulses? Okay. Well, technically, the actual definition physically by ultrasound is sound above the range of human hearing. And these are kind of ranges. Uh, we can hear up to uh, 20,000 hertz or 20 kilohertz. Dogs can do 40. Whales and dolphins can do 70. And bats, 150. So um, we're certainly on the low end of that spectrum. And uh, animals can use this. Uh, bats actually can often use it to uh, locate insects, uh, the tiny insects, to uh, at, at night, you know, use their uh, elocution, their generate sound, and they can actually capture insects. And so moths have developed a defense mechanism. There's a, a breed of moths that can actually generate sound at the same frequency. So they kind of confuse the bats. They kind of send their signals out. So when they're flying around, the bats can't tell another bat from the moth. So that's one defense mechanism they've developed. Uh, so their frequency is used in ophthalmic ultrasound. Anybody know that? 20 eight. hertz. Eight, eight to 12, up to 50. Okay, eight to twelve. What? Megahertz. Megahertz. Yeah, right. And so, in medical ultrasound, um, like the abdomen, they use lower frequencies. And why do you think that is? Why can? Why do we use such high ones and they use lower ones? They have to get uh, more depth of tissue. Right. Yeah, so the higher the frequency, the less penetration. You know, it's, uh, the sound is absorbed. It uh, doesn't penetrate uh, as far the higher the frequency. So <coughs> the other advantage of using uh, the eye, which is a small structure. And then uh, we can also uh, have a, you know, a lot of water, a lot of electric, uh, which generates sounds more easily. So uh, the business advantage, we can get these high frequencies. And we use the, the probe that we usually use, the B-scan probe that you all use, um, is, is uh, 10 megahertz. And the uh, A-scan probe that I use, the separate A-scan diagnostic A, is uh, 8 megahertz. So that's kind of our kind of bread and butter standard ultrasound. If you start getting into high frequency, they do have poster segment B-scan probes up to 20 megahertz. I don't have one of those. Uh, I've looked at them and we'll probably get one at some point. They don't add a whole lot to what we're doing. There might be a bit better resolution kind of at the uh, vitro retinal interface or the macula. But with OCT, you know, being so powerful, it probably isn't um, that necessary. Although in opaque media, when you can't use OCT, vitreous hair merge or whatever, then uh, that would be helpful to have, you know, a higher frequency for the poster segment. Now the answer segment, the immersion uh, scans, uh, I used about, about a 40 megahertz probe on my machine, but they go up to 40 and 60. You know, I know Alan Crannell for a while was using a uh, 60 megahertz probe. He was doing some uh, uh, trabecular, uh, I guess, trabeculotomy. Uh, kind of work threading uh, tubes into the brecular mesh work. So uh, that, uh, that high frequency, you really can't get much behind, be, uh, beyond the, uh, oh, the cornea, <clears throat> the anterior sclera. So you really can't even get into the anterior chamber or behind it. So again, there's always a trade-off between resolution 
and penetration. So that, uh, that's what we uh, focus on. So the piezoelectric effect, any thoughts on that? What that actually is? So it sounds like it's um, the ability of certain materials to take an electric uh, ch charge or signal in res uh, and in response to mechanical stress. And so the example in this case would be the crystal that's used in the transducer of your of the B scan probe. So it takes that um, electrical signal from the machine changes into the ultrasound waves, then is able to detect the ultrasound waves and transduce it into that electrical signal. Okay. Does that sound good, Becca? Our bioengineer? Yeah. So basically at the tip of the probe, whether it's an A or B scan probe, there's a very thin quartz crystal, you know, really, really wafer thin. And that is, as Mike said, it's generated an electrical pulse stimulates that crystal to vibrate. And that vibration is what generates the uh, ultrasound. And then the same crystal, when this, 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 this sound is generated, the sound wave travels out, hits something, and then is reflected back into the probe. Well, that same crystal is in dampened. So there's like a pulse of a thousandth of a second, and then that generates the signal. And then that crystal is dampened through internal uh, electronic uh, uh, devices, and then that uh, the returning sound wave hits that same crystal, and again vibrates it, and that vibration is picked up as electrical signal, and then displayed on the oscilloscope. So the same crystal is acting as both a sender and a receiver of sound. So that's called the piezoelectric effect. And this shows a, the upper left picture. There is a B scan probe. Um, opened up, so you've taken the, the membrane off and showing the internal, uh, the actual transducer that uh, moves back and forth. So it just goes back and forth in a horizontal plane like this. It doesn't rotate, it's just a side to side movement. So that's important to know um, when we talk about pro position and things like that. <coughs> Is that kind of clear? Bless you, Marshall. Very good. Uh, Is that clear? Um, I was wondering, uh, so in the probe, is there one crystal or two crystals? Is it the same, the like exact same crystal that does both the transceiving, transducing and receiving, or is it two, like one for each? The same crystal. Uh-huh. It does both. Hmm. So this, the crystal stimulated electrical pulses, generates a sound beam, and then uh, it, it uh, is dampened. You know, it'd still be vibrating if you didn't have somehow damp it, so it's still not vibrating from that pulse. And then it will it's, well, it's stop vibrating, returning sound hits it and stimulates it to vibrate again. And that's trans, uh, transformed into electrical energy, so mechanical. So mechanical pulse, you know, sound vibration is, is transformed into electrical. Okay, so it is the same. All right, so A scan versus B scan, what's the difference? I mean, obviously they're different because they look different, but what really, what, what's the purpose of uh, having an A scan? What does it, what does it do? What, what is, how does it expand the B scan capability? So B scan is brightness, amplitude, and then A scan is uh, time, amplitude. Okay, that's right. What does that mean? <laughs> so when you have the, the way the data is, uh, presented is that for B scan, you have um, the intensity of the waves are represented by brightness on pixels and coalescing. And right. then for A scan, you have the time uh, between the media and or you have the differences between the media interfaces, creating a linear, um, like a linear form of that representation. Okay. So basically back to your pixel idea. So on the B scan, uh, each returning sound signal that we uh, is amplified electronically and displayed is a pixel. So a little bright dots that all form together. Um, you know, the basic idea of how the television works, you're actually generating uh, electrons and, and scanning those quickly over the screen to generate a picture. Uh, same with the computer screen. So the pixels all coalesce to form an image. 
So little tiny bright dots individually. And, you know, the more you amplify that picture, the grainier it gets. You actually can start to see almost to the pixel level if you really amplify this picture really in, in high magnification. And so on the A scan, what you're doing, you're taking that same little bright dot, and instead of a bright dot display as, as on the picture, you're actually showing it as, as, a, as a vertical line. So each bright dot here is displayed on the A scan as a, as a vertical line. So it's just sort of expanding that little dot. You just think about that little tiny dot that you take a pencil and put a dot on a piece of paper, and you just took that dot and stretched it into a line. That's what the A scan is doing. So each dot here on the B scan, uh, here's in the orbit. And of course, in the glow, we don't see much because it's uh, full of vitreous. But on the, uh, on the orbit, where all these bright dots are different interfaces. So you have you know, septa, you have fat, you have muscles, nerves to generate interfaces from returning sound. Well, the A scan is just taking all those and making them vertical lines, okay? And the advantage of that is it's just easier to see. I mean, grayscale, which was the B scan is, all these broad dots, they have different degrees of grayness. And on the A scan, actually it's easier to see the difference between structures because of the vertical lines. And I'll talk a bit more about that with regarding like intraocular lesions like tumors, where that's important to know that. So there is some rationale to, to make, to have the A scan. It really does add information uh, to diagnostic uh, capability. Okay. So the co concept of a vector A scan, anybody thought about that at all? What that, what that means or do you know what that is? I wasn't super sure, but it seemed like that was, it was kind of the, um, uh, it was like the perpendicular A scan almost that was taken from the B scan. Uh-huh. Uh, right. But that's really the best. I, I couldn't find a great definition more than that. Okay. That's, that's uh, certainly part of it. And uh, every B scan machine that I'm aware of does have a vector A scan. So if you push a button on the, on the console, <clears throat> on the <clears throat> machine that we have, the LX machine, you take the B scan uh, knob and you just hit it again and that'll generate a, a, a scan at the bottom. So the, a lot of companies that sell machines will, if you ask about, do you have an A scan? They'll say, yeah, we have an A scan. You know, it's here, they push a button and show you the, the A scan at the bottom of the, of the, of the uh, picture. So people buy those machines on the basis they think they have an A scan. It really isn't. Uh, what they do is they, they take the B scan. And I don't understand all the physics of this, probably Becca does better than I do, but they can take the uh, information from the B scan and then uh, you know, treat that uh, with algorithms and things. And they can actually generate an A scan from that B scan information. So it really is, it's the same information. They're taking the same uh, sound uh, um, energy reflection back and, and translating that into a A scan. And the problem is it's just really, it's the same as the B scan basically. It doesn't really add information. Um, I mean, it shows it a bit differently as far as the display, but as far as the diagnostic capability, it really isn't the same. And I trained with Dr. Carlos Sonic who developed the A scan. And he actually from, was from Austria originally and came to Iowa and then ended up staying there. Um, I spent a year with him and the A scan that he developed is a freestanding A scan is different than the B scan. And it's, it's the, uh, the uh, amplification of it is called an S shaped curve where we instead of being logarithmic, uh, he's able to generate this curve to process information uh, where you kind of capture uh, the information uh, in the, uh, the, the middle of the curve, which really uh, optimizes it. So the concept is all kind of built into that uh, A scan, but it's a separate diagnostic A scan. It really isn't part of the B scan that we, uh, we are used to. So this shows the uh, standard uh, kind of a B scan and all the B scans have a mark on them somewhere uh, the Alex machine has this little thing, but you, sometimes it's just a line or a dot. But that the purpose of that is to tell us which way the transducer is uh, is uh, moving. 
So again, it's, it's not rotating, it's moving in a either horizontal or vertical plane. So here is where the mark is and the transducer inside is going back and forth. And here in this picture, it would be um, top of the picture to the bottom of the picture. So in a vertical direction, if you rotate the probe horizontally, then it's gonna be going in a horizontal plane. So here's in a vertical plane. If you move it as in a vertical, in a horizontal plane. So that mark is important to tell you uh, which direction the transducer is moving. The A scan doesn't have a mark on it. And the reason is because there's not a transducer inside going back and forth. It's just generating a, each pole generates a sound wave uh, that uh, is, goes out, but it doesn't uh, rotate back and forth. And it doesn't uh, move back and forth like the B scan. So the B scan is actually moving back and forth, generating the sound waves as it moves whereas the A scan is a stationary uh, probe, just generating sound waves. So, and it's, you know, it's a lot thinner, doesn't have to be bigger because of the, uh, you don't have to have the transducer going back and forth within it. But again, the tip of this probe has a thin membrane like we talked about before, the same as the B scan. And the piezoelectric effect where it's a thin membrane that's generated, uh, simulated by electronic pulses, generating sound waves and they hit the probe and form a picture. So it's the same concept as that piezoelectric effect. All right, this is a vector A scan. So I'm, uh, this is shows the B scan picture up here. And at the bottom, you can see an A scan. So it does generate an A scan picture. Um, and the only really use I have for this is if I have like a staphyloma. So here's a case. So here's the cornea up here. Here's the iris going through vitreous, and here's the staphylomus, see how it kind of bulges out in the back. So if you're trying to do an axial length for biometry, um, sometimes you can be deceived, like when you, um, you know, have the patient focus on the light or whatever, and the uh, sound wave hits the back of the eye. If you have a staphyloma, that can, you can be deceived. If you hit on the edge of the staphyloma, you get one axial length. If you hit in the depth of it, you get another axial length. So which one do you use? And that can be a real problem. And even the IOL master has the same issue that if it's a staphyloma, uh, are you hitting the bottom of the staphyloma? Is that the true axial length? Or are you hitting on the edge of it? And that can really determine um, the, the, you know, the power when you finally get your actual axial length to plug into your formula for your lens implant power. Uh, that'll obviously be different uh, where you are in the staphyloma. So the vector A scan, you can actually move this, see this line here, this dark line? You can move that with a, a dial up or down. So you can put the vector here, you can put the vector here, the vector here. So the B scan actually lets you visualize where that, where that uh, beam is going, where it's hitting. So if you want to be in the bottom of the staphyloma, you can you put it in there. If you want to be on the edge, you can put it up there. So the question is, where's the macula? We had an interesting case a couple of years ago where um, there was a staphyloma right to the edge of the macula. So the question was, was, was the macula, was the depth of that in the macula or was it just to the side of it? So I, in that case, I used an OCT. So I took the OCT and we could tell the staphyloma just ended just right at the edge of the macula. So we didn't want to be in the depth of the staph staphyloma because that would be too long. So we actually used the vector on the ultrasound machine to move it slightly to the side of the, sta of the staphyloma and got the axial length. So, and the, and the power ended up being correct when we patient, but after a surgery was refracted and it was like real close to Plano. So uh, that's an advantage of, uh, that's the one time that I use that vector A scan in those situations. Is that gonna make sense? Yeah, it does. Um, anyway, so the A scan on this, you, know, you can look at it, you can say, well, if you had a tumor, you know, you might see this is the surface of it and maybe internally it's high or low reflective. You can sort of get a rough idea. So if you had nothing else, uh, you can still use this A scan, you know, to sort of help. But the real diagnostic criteria that was established by Dr. Osonig uh, really, it doesn't work very well. So uh, if, if a person has a, chance, has a choice, they have the budget to do it. I always advise them to get a freestanding A scan. 
So like we have in all our machines that we use, we have the separate B scan pro, A scan pro. And I think they all have the uh, biometry. I mean, they have the uh, high frequency EVM probe too. Okay. So perpendicularity, which is really important, um, being perpendicular. How do you know if you're perpendicular to a surface? Uh, if you're doing an uh, ultrasound on a patient, you want to be perpendicular, uh, trying to get the surface of a lesion or the uh, UN biometry. You want to get the, uh, you know, get on the retina. How do you know if you're perpendicular to a surface? There's the highest amplitudes. Yeah. Uh huh. You want to you know, maximize the height. And that's right. You know, this this demonstrates that. This shows, you know, if you're perpendicular to a surface, you get maximal returning uh, energy. So the sound wave gener sent out hits the surface, bounces back. You get a high spike. If you angle that probe obliquely, you lose some of the energy. You know, some of the sound energy goes off to the side. It's not reflected directly back. Just like light. You know, if you're reflecting light from something. If you're perpendicular, you get maximal uh, reflection. And if you're oblique, you get less so. Um, and more oblique you are, the less energy you get. So being perpendicular, you can actually look at the screen and see on the B scan, you go by brightness, the brighter the image, um, the, high, the more perpendicular you are. And the A scan, the higher reflective, and the steeper it is, the more, um, um, even, you know, if it's on the, on the A scan here, I'm comparing, this is the initial signal from the probe. Every probe generates a certain signal, and this is it from the A scan. And you want to compare that to the height of the surface you're looking at. So going through the eye here, here's a small tumor. And as you hit the tumor, you get this high spike going up. And I know here I'm perpendicular because this is maximally high. If I compare this to the surface, to the initial signal, I get a very high spike here. It's even, it's smooth. There's no little uh, nodes on it. It's just an even surface. That is a maximal perpendicularity. And the advantage of that is I then can then analyze internal structure. I can look inside this. This is kind of a low reflective, slightly irregular. There's a little spike inside, but I really can uh, adequately analyze internal structure, which is really critical for intraocular tumors the criteria for melanoma diagnosis really depends on that internal reflectivity, if it's regular, if it's high or low, if it's even. Um, so I'm perpendicular here, and this is the same lesion where I'm oblique. This is just an artifact from being oblique, but here's the actual lesion where the arrows are, and that shows that I'm not perpendicular because this initial signal isn't very high. It only goes to that height compared to that height. If I look internally, if I compared internal signals to the surface of this, they are they're much higher. Just you know, forget the rest of it. Just look at that part um, compared to the surface of this lesion. Internal reflectivity would actually be high, medium to high, whereas here it's low. You know, so I've changed my diagnostic criteria by being not perpendicular. So that's why it's important to do that. And again, it's biometry. If you're measuring the actual length with ultrasound need to get that retinal spike really high, steep, even. Okay, so that's the importance of being perpendicular. Um, the average sound velocity in vitreous. Fifteen hundred meters per second. Yeah, that's about 1532. And why is that important? Well, it's, if you're ever doing your own formulas, we actually, I first started doing ultrasound, we didn't have all the formulas we have now, so we actually had to kind of do our own. So we actually had to do, do the calculations and plug in numbers. So we actually had to know those numbers. So it's just, it's, you know, right now you don't really need that with modern um, instrumentation, but at least to know the, the, the basis of it. So the denser a structure is, the, uh, the uh, faster the, the velocity. So water is the lowest here and bone is the highest. So aqueous vitreous is kind of in the middle. And the, the lens you can see is higher, the lens is denser. So you get faster sound velocity through the lens. And some formulas 
I don't think they do now. They used to require actually entering the different numbers. You'd actually enter a number in for the anterior chamber, which is, you know, aqueous. Um, and then you'd enter a separate number in for the lens, which is a, a diff different number. So uh, then the calculation, the formula would sort of average those and use that as part of your, your calculation. And I think now it's just more of an average. I think most formulas, most uh, things that we do use just this, this number as an average with really disregarding the lens, but there's a slight tiny error introduced by not using a separate sound velocity for the lens. That's just why it's important to kind of know that concept of different sound velocities. All right, acoustic impedance. Anybody want to tackle that one? I even give you the formula. So it's defined as sound velocity times density. It's like the resistance that sound faces when going through a uh, like substance. Okay. Yeah, so it's how difficult it is for sound waves to get through something that has to pass through. Okay, right. And so the importance of this basically is probably less the actual equation. It's just more is a difference concept. So when you go through any kind of a tissue or structure, you have a certain acoustic impedance number. You have a value based on this formula, the sound velocity times the density of that given structure. When you enter another structure or encounter it, you then are changing impedance. So if you go from like vitreous um, to like a tumor. So here's an example to kind of walk you through this. So here's a densely cellular structure. This is a melanoma. So you have a lot of cells all kind of packed together, but are homogeneous. You got a few blood vessels kind of scattered around, but basically it's a fairly homogeneous uh, uh, tissue. So um, this homogeneity, uh, really the sound doesn't have a whole lot to reflect back from. So if you go into the vitreous on the B scan, you get darkness. And then on the A scan, you get low reflectivity. Try and move this over. Let's see, there we go. All right, so you're going through. Oops, there we go. You're going through the uh, vitreous here. So here's the initial signal from the probe going to the vitreous. There's a little noise right there that's just against artifact, probably just from not being quite perpendicular or whatever. You go through the vitreous, which is usually very, very flat, but there's no interfaces corresponding to darkness on the B scan, you then hit the surface of the tumor. So here it is, here's a small melanoma. And so you hit it, the surface right there, and here's the surface on the A scan. So that change in impedance, you're going along here at a certain sound velocity, a certain density, aqueous, uh, vitreous density. And then you hit this tumor, which is a different uh, density. So you change your sound velocity and tissue density. So that change generates that spike and the same on the V scan. So you're going from one impedance value to a different one and that change, that interface between the two gives you that, that surface. So the V scan, you see it here, A scan, you see it here is that spike. Once you're inside, you're at a different impedance, again, because you're inside this, this tissue, which a melanoma has a different impedance than other tissues would so that difference uh, as is a fairly homogeneous structure. So again, impedance starts to drop. It becomes more, uh, it becomes lower, almost not quite as low as vitreous, but slightly above vitreous. This is a very dense <coughs> melanoma in this situation. And the B scan <coughs> shows again, the, the brightness corresponds to, to uh, density. So you can see the problem here with the B scan this looks pretty bright. So based on the gray scale, I mean, that could be a melanoma, <clears throat> that could be hemangioma, could be metastatic, it really doesn't. I mean, the shape is very, very well-defined. That's the use of the B scan. But once you're inside that lesion, really to determine tissue differentiation, it really is hard because you just have kind of a you know gray scale and the human eye really has not the ability to really define gray scale that well. 
Whereas the A scan, you can see very obviously, it's a little reflective, it's very irregular. So here's the advantage of the A scan where you've taken those pixels and instead of being a grayscale uh, display, you've gone to a linear vertical display. And that just allows us with our minds and our eyes to be able to sort of see the difference more obviously. So this is a good example of that. So this is impedance here showing you going from a vitreous to the tumor, get a high spike. Once you're inside, you start to get more homogeneous, you get low reflectivity, then you hit the retina. So you change impedance again, another high spike of the retina. And once you're in the orbit, you get a lot of interfaces. So there's not much chance for the sound to start dropping down again to baseline. These interfaces keeps, the sound beam keeps hitting interfaces and bouncing back. And so you get all these different interfaces inside the orbit. So that's a good demonstration of the difference here. And this is the impedance concept where you're changing, going from one tissue to a different one, getting a change in impedance. So here's uh, from one tissue here, the vitreous tumor orbit. So you can see the difference in display in each one. And the B scan shows the same concept, but it just, it doesn't uh, internally, once you're inside that structure, the differentiation is much harder with the B scan than the A scan. Is that sort of clear? That's probably the fundamental concept of ultrasound. If you understand that, you really kind of know what you're doing when you're looking at different, different structures. So any questions about that? Okay, the B scan probe. Um, let's see, did I change that? There you go. Now this is an example here. This is the orbit. This really illustrates that uh, even better. So these are different orbital lesions. And this is uh, the first one here is normal. So you're going through the eye here. So this is uh, flat, vitreous. Once you're in the orbit, you get all these high spikes in the orbit from all these different interfaces. So you get, you know, muscle, septa, fat, whatever's in the orbit. So you get a lot of interfaces normally. Here's a lesion, and this shows going through the vitreous, and here's the lesion, which you can see right away is different than the normal orbit. It is wider, and these, these spikes are kind of going up and down. You sort of see it go down pretty low, up pretty high, down pretty low, kind of this seesaw up and down uh, variation. This is a cavernous hemangioma, and that corresponds to the A scan because the sound beam starts to go through one of these little uh, honeycomb cells full of blood, and it starts to go down because blood is homogeneous. You start to get a dip in the signal. You hit an interface, change in impedance, you get a high spike. You hit, it goes up. Hit another cell of blood, starts to go down, hits the septa, goes up. So this up and down, back and forth, seesaw kind of picture corresponds pathologically to the tissue. That's what first really excited me about A scan. I did my, I did my was with my residency at UCLA. I used to spend uh, time around the ultrasound department, and I just really was fascinated by this concept, being able to actually differentiate things pathologically. Um, another lesion here, and this is actually a, a benign mixed cell of the of the lacrimal gland. So this is going this kind of up and down pattern because. Pathologically, that's what you have in a benign mixed cell. You have these uh, areas, cystic areas of tissue, and then you have a, a tumor beam around that. So the up and down pattern. And this it looks like hemangioma a little bit. It's a bit lower. As you go to the lesion, it kind of energy is absorbed and it starts to drop off. And also where the look, lesion's located, most hemangiomas are kind of in the uh, interconal space whereas lacrimal gland tumors are up in the superior temporal area. So again, by location, you sort of differentiate them, but even with that, you can see some difference between these two. Um, this uh, is a meningioma. Uh, you can see again, the density of tissue with some interfaces. This is a lymphoma uh, with real low reflectivity, very dense uh, tissue. So it's less important to know what these all mean at this point, it's just to see the difference. You can just see how the A scan really just takes that information and makes it more interpretable. 
you can see all the, the spikes. If you had grayscale with the B scan, just kind of all mudges together. Uh, when I first started doing ultrasound, I bought a, a book by uh, Jackson Coleman about B scan of the orbit. They all kind of looked the same. I didn't, he had all these chapters on these different lesions and he would talk about differences, but it was just so subtle. It's almost like the days when I was before uh, MRIs and CT scans. Again, I trained in those days of just plain film x-rays. And these guys were amazing. The radiologists would have conferences and they'd show these pictures uh, of, of x-rays of different things in the orbit. And they could tell often by inferring by changes in the bone what, what lesions were, but really to redefine lesions, obviously with MRI and CT, we've, we far surpassed that. But that art of being able to take a plain film X-ray, make all these little nuances and uh, inferences about subtle changes. Um, the same with the B-scan. The B-scan really uh, by itself is really hard to tell a difference, but the A-scan just kind of amplifies that difference. And that's why it's important. It can be a real addendum to other modalities. All right, so on the examination um, techniques, uh, we have the, the basic views, which are axial, putting the probe directly on the cornea, going straight back, or uh, transverse or longitudinal. And I, all of you, I think, as you've worked with me, I've kind of, I always ask you about this, which, which probe position is. So how do we define a transverse position? Any takers on that? It's when the, the transducer is moving parallel to the limbus. All right, there's my man. You can graduate now, Mike. You can you can you passed. So you yes. Can <laughs> <laughs> um, exactly right. So uh, when the transducer is moving parallel to the limbus. So here's a limbus here, and again, this is just a two-dimensional picture. So you have to think three-dimensionally. But that transducer is moving back and forth. It's moving towards out of the plane of the picture and then back uh, into the depths of the picture uh, in a, in a uh, parallel position to the limbus. And see the beam here is generated. So again, that's parallel to that limbus. If you rotate that probe where the mark is perpendicular, the transducer is going down a vertical up and down direction, and that is perpendicular. So it's defined, transverse is defined as parallel to the limbus from the Transducer is moving that way, and the marker tells you which way it's moving because that's the transducer inside is moving back and forth. And then the longitudinal when it's vertical, when it's perpendicular to that uh, the limbus. So those are two positions. Why is that important? Because when you're doing different, uh, especially with tumor uh, measurements, which we do a lot of, a lot of melanomas, and a lot of those are treated with plaques. They didn't know how to make plaque, the radioactive iodine plaque. They actually once we do the measurements of the tumor and they're gonna treat it, they will then send this to the, uh, to the radiation people. They'll actually fabricate the plaque based on those measurements. So they need to know uh, these different dimensions. If the tumor is quite round, quite symmetrical, they're pretty much the same transverse and longitudinal measurements, but if it's kind of you know, uh, elliptical, or not symmetrical, then you have different measurements and that's important to really cover the whole tumor with the plaque. You wanna always overlap a millimeter or so when you're making these plaques to be sure you kill all the tumors. So these are not just theoretical concepts, they really are practical to know what you're doing. You can do an axial view, you can put the probe right over the cornea and which way the marker goes there doesn't really matter because you're just going straight back. But the disadvantage of that is that a lot of times patients don't like right on their eye, they kind of get nervous if you're coming right down in the cornea. And also you have the lens absorbing energy, so you lose some, lose some energy, so you don't get quite the resolution that you would with when you're bypassing the lens with an oblique uh, position like transverse or longitudinal. So those are basic pro positions. Dr. Harry, this might be a dumb question, but uh, Marshall and I were talking yesterday about what's truly transverse and uh, longitudinal, because I guess when you say um, perpendicular to the limbus, I get confused because the limbus is round. So <laughs> can you kind of just clarify, uh, I guess, probe positioning in that sense? Okay, wait, well, go back to your Euclidean, your Euclidean geometry class. You remember that? <laughs> All right, so if, even though it's round, even though your limbus is round, if you take right. a line 
and you kind of drew the line, you can either draw the line, you know, along this way, along the edge of the limbus, or mm -hmm. you can draw the line that way, bisecting the limbus. So either right. parallel or bisecting the limbus. So here you're going parallel. That sound beam is actually going back and forth parallel. Just uh -huh. think of the sound, this transducer is moving back and forth like that. Mm -hmm. and that is parallel. If you move the transducer here, it's going like this. So you're bisecting that limbus. So that is perpendicular to it. Does that kind of make more sense? Yes. I guess because okay. even with the longitudinal B scan, you would be parallel to the inferior limbus. Does that make like, do you know what I mean? But, but I guess yeah. your reference point is is what you're changing your reference point, I guess, is what you're I understand now. Yeah. The probe is always, you know, touching the edge of the limbus. So you're always at the edge of it. Okay. But the way now you think of the sound beam, the sound beam that's generated is going uh, in this case, it's going in a it's you know perpendicular, it's not parallel, right. it's actually going this way, bisecting. Does that gotcha. make sense? Yes. Okay. I was also confused because it seemed like when I was, it seemed like um, people describe like lots of like many different transverse views. And obviously you can do that with the longitudinal view also, but it seemed like uh -huh. people mostly just did like the longitudinal macula view. So I was a little confused as to do people do the longitudinal view like 360 around or do they kind of do transverse 360 and longitudinal just for the macula or something for the LMAC view? Good question. When I do it, um, you know, technically you should do both. You should go in six different because each each uh, B scan sound generation is fifth is uh, fifty degree uh, sixty degrees. So sixty degrees you're, are the fundus you're covering. So six into three sixty is sixty. So if you take six views, you could cover the entire globe. If you you know move the probe around, you start in fairly and you aim. You go maybe the you, know, you put the probe at the bottom of the eye. Um, here and you're going towards 12 o'clock, you move it over to four o'clock, over to two o'clock. So you go around in six different uh, clock hours, you're covering the entire extent of the fundus. And so I, you, technically you should do a transverse view to do all that, then longitudinal. The advantage of longitudinal is you can get a little further out. The sound beam when you're doing this allows you to get a little bit more towards the aura, whereas a transverse is harder to do that, just kind of you know technically. Uh, ergonomically, so um, you should really kind of do both. I'm lazy and I just usually just do one. I'll just do transverse, go around, you know, just scan it that way. But I try to really angle the probe as far as I can. But if you watch me, like if I get a vitreous detachment, I'm looking for a retinal tear, uh, you, you know, it's got an eyeful of blood, you can't see the, the fundus with the ophthalmoscope. So the ultrasound is really important to try to localize a tear. So I will use this position to really get as far out as I can to really look towards the aura with the longitudinal position. Um, and I'll go around and try to do the different positions. So you really should be doing both. But again, I've done this enough. I just kind of know what I'm looking for and I take shortcuts. So I just usually use the transfers just because it's faster. But that's a good question. Okay. So the three major, we talked about the three major propositions, actual transfers, longitudinal. Uh, emerging ultrasounds, why do we have to do all, you know, put this thing between the eyelids and fill it full of water? Because um, um, we have to find like the uh, focal zone of the image and only the middle third of an image is in the focal zone, whereas the first third is blurry and the last third is blurry as well and out of focus. Okay, that's good. So when you put the probe against the eye, if you put it directly on the eye, let's say the, you know, the slur is out here, I put the probe directly against it. This is called the dead zone. And this area here, based on the, the mechanics of the probe, the physics of it, the way that when the sound is generated by the, the crystal and bounces back, this area here, you kind of lose information. Somehow buried in here is a sclera. And let's say you're doing a, you know, axial position or your, the lens is in here somewhere, enter chamber really can't see any of that because it's all buried in this dead zone. So you really, if you're trying to look at an anterior segment tumor or something, you wouldn't be able to see it because of this dead zone. And the A-scan, the same concept there. Try to find an A-scan here to show you. So the A-scan up here, this is the dead zone of the A-scan. So this area here is about three to five millimeters. And within that, it's buried all whatever you're touching. So if the probe is right against the sclera, you're gonna have the sclera in here somewhere. If you're 
and, and, you know, the axial view, you're going to get the lens in here, enter chamber. So you just can't see that. You really can't differentiate it. So that's where the, uh, the immersion concept comes in. This is an immersion scan. So here, this is just a regular uh, 10 megahertz B scan. You can do immersion with that. You don't have to always have the high frequency scan, but you got a little scleral shell here to put the probe in. I'll show you a picture of that. And then um, the cornea is here and here's the iris and here's a tumor. You can see a ciliary body tumor that you wouldn't be able to see. You would miss that if you just did a regular contact B scan. You put right against the eye, that area is in the dead zone. But here by moving the probe back in that immersion bath of water, of methacellulose, you can actually see that structure. So it just moves that probe back and lets you look at an area that otherwise is hidden. So that's why immersion is important because you can see structures. So again, here's an axial view. Here's the cornea, here's the anterior chamber, here's the iris, here's that part of the tumor. All of this would be hidden uh, if you didn't do the immersion scan. And I, I forgot to put this picture in this uh, series, but when I trained again, there was, we used to do, uh, we had a big frame, big metal frame set up. We put a big plastic drape uh, within that frame and then fill it full of water and the poor patients under all this. It's like they're being waterboarded. You know, they didn't like it. They were, you know, if you're claustrophobic, you just, it was miserable. So all these techniques we do now with these scleral shells and things uh, really make that easy. And I think uh, Tina was asking me about, you know, immersion, um, I guess, for doing cornea work and things like the end here segment. If you don't have a high frequency probe like we do here, you can still use a 10 megahertz B scan probe. You just take a tonal pen cover or cut the tip of a glove, you know, a exam glove off, put that over the tip, fill it full of fluid. You can use that. This is what was done in this case. It's just it's a tonal pen uh, immersion scan. We just didn't even use a, 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 a scleral shell. We just put this tonal pen cover over the probe, fill it full of uh, saline solution, and then we can actually see anterior segment structures. You don't get the resolution you do with like a high frequency UBM probe, but you can still see it. You know, you can still see there's a tumor there. So that's advantage. So silicon oil, how does that affect the ultrasound picture? Dr. Harry, you can, sorry, just can I ask a question about um, Immersion scans really quick. I also read that uh, that it's really important to, or like it's the gold standard to do immersion scans when measuring for axial length of biometry, just because there there's no indentation of the cornea to affect the axial length. But I just wondered your thoughts on that. How much would how much does that, or could that really affect your measurement? Yeah, that's a good question. And obviously, you you couldn't you couldn't even see the cornea if you didn't do some kind of immersion. So a lot of the before. IOL Master became popular. A lot of the A scan uh, units were for biometry. The probe had a little built in water bath. It wasn't just this crystal right at the tip of the probe like we have now. There's a little built in water bath right inside, and that gave you enough immersion to be able to stand the probe back and actually identify the cornea and the anterior segment structure. So, uh, and again, indentation, that's the one problem with that concept, though, as you say. If you did that with that probe right against the cornea touching it, um, you could get some, a small amount of indentation and that could affect your, uh, your measurements. I mean, your final calculation. So um, I, I gotta, let me show you this slide real quick. I'll just kind of skip over. So this shows if you have a millimeter error in axial length, that translates to a 2.5 diopter error in your IOL, which is pretty significant. So that shows how it's important really, you know, get this down uh, as low as you can. So if you take a tenth of that, even a tenth of a millimeter error, you're still getting a 0.25 diopter error, which is probably within the range of acceptability. Nowadays with modern refractive cataract surgery, you know, patients are demanding a lot more and they want to really, we've seen this, you know, patients at the VA, we have a patient that was kind of undercorrected and he's kind of constantly unhappy. We have to kind of massage him every time he comes in and uh, make him happy. But sure, that was my it. patient. <laughs> I think last time I think he was actually pretty happy last time I saw him, though. I think actually he was finally accepting it. He's about, I think, a spherical equivalence, about a um, like a minus one or something close to that. And he's really without glasses most of the time now. He, he wears them to drive at night, so he really finally kind of accepted it. And I, I thought he would. I think we just kind of, you know, gave him the chance to kind of get used to it. So 
But anyway, it just shows the sensitivity of this. And K readings too, they're, they're not quite as, uh, it's almost like a one-to-one -one here, like almost a one diopter error in your keratometry translates to a one diopter in your IOL, but the axial length is really a pretty sensitive uh, uh, formula. So that really is important to try to, to you know, minimize error. And again, if you push the probe against the cornea and compress it, you could give a you know theoretically shorter eye than really is 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 uh, is true. So that's the importance of not trying to compress the cornea. So that's why most immersion techniques use a little kind of shell or something to actually separate the probe from the cornea and not push on it. Um, so silicone oil, you can tell right away if it's silicone um, just by you look at this picture. And the eye just looks funny. It's kind of, the retina is kind of hard to see and it's just bigger. So this is an eye with silicone in it. This is after silicone has been taken out. So this is the same eye, just shows the difference. You can just see the eye is not as long. Um, so silicone gives you an artificially long eye. And the reason for that is? Slows is, down the sound. Yeah and slower. So these are all the lost sound velocities. So remember the average sound velocity in vitreous is what? Do you remember that number? 1532. 50, so that was that's a normal vitreous and this is with silicon oil and if you're phacic or aphacic it changes because of the you know, lens velocity but sound velocity and lens but it shows us around a thousand compared to 1532. So that's quite a difference. So that it's slower. And so the machine interprets that since it's um, um, slower, it takes longer for the sound to get to the retina and back again. The machine thinks that's a longer eye because of, you know, if it takes longer to get back to the, to the, to the probe, the eye must be longer, even though, even though it's not, it's just actually um, uh, slower sound velocity. So silicone oil all gives you an artificially, artificially long eye. So most of these are like around 30 to up to 35 millimeters. If you use that for your eye well, you'd be way off as far as your calculations. So um, you have to really correct for that. And again, when I first started doing this, we actually had to go back and use a formula. We would take this number over 1532 times that by what we got on the ultrasound and get a number for the actual length, but now it just does it automatically. IL Master just goes right through this and does an immediate correction factor for it. The ultrasound machine, we actually have to change the gain, the setting on the machine to actually show a different sound velocity, which is easy to do with the machine that we have, but it still shows how that can affect that number. Okay, so silicon oil, if you see a big funny looking eye, that usually is going to be an eye full of silicon, you know, kind of right away that it's, it's silicon oil in that eye. Okay. And this shows that concept of immersion. So this little shells between the eyelids, you're putting the probe inside that full of, of fluid, saline solution or something, and that allows you to separate these different structures out. So here's the tip of the probe. You get the initial signal we talked about before. You go through the little shell here. Here's that space here. You hit the cornea, you get that signal. You go through the anterior chamber, that's that space. Anterior lens there, through the lens, posterior lens, vitreous, retina. So it just separates these structures out. And if this probe was right against the cornea, you would lose all this. You would just see kind of this spike here, maybe just the edge of that, but you wouldn't see any of that. So you really couldn't even do uh, this immersion scan, you really can separate out the structures unless you did an immersion scan. So that just shows the importance of somehow backing this probe away from this front of the eye. And we used to have these because when I, believe it or not, when I first trained, we didn't even do axial length. We didn't do ultrasound biometry. We just put a standard lens implant. Everybody got a, I think a 19 diopter lens implant. We just kind of took the average, you know, person's refraction, and that's what they would all get, which works a lot of the time. But if you have, you know, if you're myopic, hyperopic, have a long eye, short eye, you get these terrible surprises, up to nine diopter surprises. So they were pretty common in those days. So 
we've come a long way. And again, that concept about uh, sensitivity, about error. All right, so all that we've learned, all this theory and stuff we've been talking about, let's translate that into something kind of practical here. So tell me, um, looking at this, let's do a, here's a B scan of a lesion. So here's a lesion here, You're going through the vitreous. <clears throat> and here's the A scan. <clears throat> so what does the A scan look like that? <clears throat> In other words, <clears throat> so what's your diagnosis of the A scan <clears throat> of the uh, lesion based on the A scan characteristics? We've <clears throat> kind of given you a hint here. I've shown you the lesion. I've shown you the pathology, but just if you have the A scan only, how would you describe that A scan? <clears throat> so you're going through the vitreous here. Here's the surface of the lesion. Here's the sclera. So reflectivity. How high reflectivity. <laughs> so high. Is it pretty regular? Is it irregular? Pretty regular. Pretty regular. Yeah, pretty regular. I mean, it's up and down, but it's in a regular pattern. It's not like really crazy, like you go way, way down, way, way up. It's all kind of in the same level. So like instantly, I know that's a hemangioma. It's just, I look at that like in three seconds. And I'd probably go once a month, I'll get a patient referred from you know, a good retina guy um, in the community. And they'll say it's a melanoma. And they told the patient that and they're all set to be treated for that. I'll look I'm, right away. It's not a melanoma. I just, I can just say like 99.9% .9 that's not melanoma. They just don't look like that. Whereas a B scan, that could be melanoma. You know, that's just kind of non specific. That grayscale um, could be, you know, the differential of which we'll talk about a bit tomorrow, intraocular tumors. That could be any of those. So the A scan right away, you just, wow, you just know what it is, you know? So that's just, that's just a value. So the A scanner really just takes all those little pixel areas of grayscale and puts them in a linear fashion that we can actually see and recognize more easily. I have a so I have a question about this one. So in the path, obviously you see that, but I guess to me, in the B scan, I would think that it would be more sawtooth. I guess maybe more irregular um, than you like uh, the previous A scan that you showed us, since there are all these different septae and blood vessels. So that's why. Uh -huh. I, it like confuses me that it's it's so hom homogenous, I guess. Right. And again, you think about the structure pathologically. Now, this is really, this is microscopic. These are really little tiny spaces. So if you're a sound beam, think of yourself as a sound beam, you're going through this little vascular space full of blood. Blood's pretty homogeneous. You start to get a little drop in the, uh, in the uh, spike. Homo the more homogeneous the structure is, the lower reflectivity it is, the less interfaces to reflect sound. So vitreous is very flat. So you start to get a little drop in the, in the um, because of this, the blood in the space, but then you hit an interface pretty soon. You know, it's really just a microsecond that you're going through this little tiny space. You hit an interface and it goes up again. You go through another space, starts to go down and it goes up again. So there's not really time for it to go down very far because these are so small. If these are big, huge spaces, like a cavernous mangioma in the orbit, then you do get more of it, you know, really going down, really up, really down, really up. But here there's so little, you just, there's not really time for it to go down very far. So you kind of stay on the high side. You get little tiny up and down dips, but mostly it's high. Does that kind of answer your question? So if these were bigger spaces, you'd get a lower dip because these spaces are full of blood, blood's homogeneous. So you start to get the sound going down because it's homogeneous. But because there's so little, there's not time for it to get down very far. It's another space and it goes up again. So you get really, it's generally quite on the, on the high side. Okay. If I yeah. Orbital hemangioma, which is bigger, it's just bigger tissues and bigger spaces. Then there's more time for the sound to go down. So you get more of this up and down. Okay. So kind of picture. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. All right. Bonus question. Is Cole on this this morning? Come on, Dr. Harry. <laughs> Cole, my man. <laughs> what is it, Cole? Go for it. 
Oh man. Let's see. So you take half of the astigmatic power. So diopter and a quarter. And then add to the spherical equivalent. So uh, minus two then. Yeah. Is he right? Everybody yeah. agree? Yes, yeah. All right. Now, why is that important? Why do you care about spherical equivalent? What is, will it ever matter? Can you see a, a context where that would matter to know that? If you're putting in a non toric lens in a patient with astigmatism? Yeah, that's true. A non toric contact lens as well. Yeah, like a hard contact lens. Exactly right. Now, soft contacts often are toric, and you want to have astigmatic, and we're so used to now to with, you know, we think of astigmatism, we're putting toric lenses in. What's what's the cutoff at the VA? Is it like one diopter for you start thinking toric lenses? It depends uh, on different attendings, but usually a little, um, you know, anywhere from 0.75 to 1, then we at least run the calcs and see what we would. Right. They only, I mean, we only go down to T3, so. Okay. But before toric lenses, you know, as you said, that uh, we didn't really have that. So you just had to sort of, you had to get as close as you could to what, you know, you thought the power was going to be kind of, you know, the astigmatism is still there and you're still going to have a little error because of that. But if you can use this, you can get kind of close to it. And I use it. I, I check kids at the detention center. I volunteer and take glasses out to them. And instead of, uh, I actually take glasses with me. I used to try to get the glasses made for the kids by the time they, you know, I sent them to the optician, got them made, brought them back. The kids were gone, such a high turnover. So I just take a bunch of glasses with me. I got all these spherical powers up from minus one to minus 10 or so in half diopter steps. I just give them glasses on the spot. And astigmatism, you know, usually I just use this. I just, I have up, up to maybe three diopters of astigmatism. I'll get spherical equivalents. And they're actually pretty close, you know, for kids that don't have glasses and can't see, that makes a big difference. If they get real high numbers, I will have glasses made and try to just chase, trace the kids down later. But in a practical sense, that is important to know that, how to make that calculation. And so anyway, Cole, you got it. So you can come back to the VA now. All right, so that's it for ultrasound. Any other questions or we're good?